night and suddenly the dreaded page duty alarm goes off. You go to your laptop and check Grafana and all the graphs are trending up. Your service is not processing requests. However, you've seen this issue many times before and it's a simple fix. All you need to do is restart the service. So now the issue is fixed in two minutes, but your good night's sleep is ruined and you're awake. Hi, I'm Chris Shepard, and today I'm going to talk about how we made some of our services self-healing at Cloudflare using different Go concurrency techniques. Now, our implementation is built using it for Kafka and runs on Kubernetes. However, this could be modified for any environment or any message queuing system. So at Cloudflare, we're big adopters of Go, and we run it at massive scale. We've been running Go in production since 2012, and it was chosen as our primary language because of its high performance, excellent concurrency, and extended standard library. These days, we have over 1,000 microservices with over 70 teams running, uh, writing Go every day, and it's deployed in all our data centers around the world. And some of our applications process literally millions of messages per second. And at this scale, it's really important to make sure that our services are independent and as decoupled as possible. So for this, we use an event-driven architecture with Kafka at the heart of it. So what is Kafka? Kafka is an open source distributed event streaming platform. And there are a few key concepts to remember for this. Kafka messages are uh, split into topics, and topics are broken down further into partitions. And partitions are used to guarantee ordering of messages within the partition. Producers are responsible for publishing messages to topics, and consumers will read from Kafka by subscribing to and consuming from topics. And to keep track of their progress, consumers use offsets. And you can think of these like bookmarks. They're an auto-incrementing integer that acts as a unique identifier as a, for a position of record in the consumer. Now at Cloudflare, we use Sarama, which is a Go client for Kafka. And this was built by Shopify originally, and now it's maintained by IBM. So at Cloudflare, we deploy our applications that use Kafka on Kubernetes. And we run both of these on bare metal, along with some other things like our databases. For those who are not familiar with Kubernetes, it's an open source platform for managing containerized workloads, and it's actually also written in Go. Now in Kubernetes, deployments are used, are used to manage replica sets, and replica sets basically maintain a collection of replica pods. And pods are where we basically run our application containers, and these are the smallest deployable unit of compute in Kubernetes. Now quite often, running a single instance of an application is just not sufficient. It might, it's important to have multiple instances for scale or fault tolerance reasons. And something that both Kafka and Kubernetes excel at is horizontal scaling. So in Kubernetes, we can run multiple replicas by creating uh, multiple pods. And in Kafka, topics are split into partitions, as I mentioned before. And this allows messages to be consumed in parallel by separate pods. Now, in the past, we actually found that having one-to-one -one mapping between pods and partitions was not always the most performant. So in the cases where there are less, part less pods than partitions, a single pod can actually consume from multiple partitions in separate Go routines. Now, distributed systems like this can be really hard to manage. Since components run independently, some parts can keep running whilst others have failed. And components can fail for all sorts of different reasons, like transient connectivity loss, uh, temporary uh, configuration errors, or problems with external dependencies. And for that reason, it's really important that we assert an application's health to by ensuring that all the components are working so we can continue processing requests. Unfortunately for us, Kubernetes has some good utilities to do this. So in Kubernetes, there are three types of health checks. The first ones are the liveness probes, and these are used to know when to restart an application container. So a liveness probe should catch a deadlock when an application is running but unable to process requests. And in, the case, in this case, restarting a container is usually the right thing to do to keep the application available even when bugs are present. The second one we have are readiness probes, and these are used to know when a container is ready to start accepting traffic. So in the case of an API, when the pod is not ready, it will be removed from the service load balancers. Now, Kafka consumers don't typically accept HTTP traffic, so the readiness probes are kind of redundant here. So for this reason, we only tend to set the liveness checks. And finally, we have start probes. These just replace the liveness checks on slow starting containers, just to make sure they're not killed before they're up and running, basically. So how do these checks work? From a high level, the kubelet, which is an agent running on each node, will check that the application is healthy by hitting a pre-configured endpoint. And typically, the application will reply with either a healthy response, which would be like a 200 status code, or an unhealthy response, which would be anything over a 399. And in the case of a Linus endpoint, if we receive a certain amount of failures, then we'll, rest we'll kill the pod and restart it. Now at Cloudflare, we had a pretty naive approach to health checks in the past. We would actually just check the underlying connection status between the application and the Kafka broker. And we do this usually by listing the topic on the broker. 
Uh, now, this did a pretty good job at catching certain errors, so things like TLS problems or degraded connection, and the applications would restart accordingly. However, they didn't catch all the problems with Kafka consumers. As mentioned earlier in the talk, liveness checks should catch a deadlock where an application is still running but unable to make progress, and this actually wasn't always the case for us. Sometimes our consumers would just sit idle and they wouldn't process messages. And this ultimately led to lag on the partition, which could then cause incidents. And one example of an incident we had from this was delays to time-sensitive emails, which is obviously not great for our customers. So because of this, our team actually had a pretty noisy on-call due to Kafka-related issues. We used Prometheus for metrics and Alert Manager for alerting via page duty. And generally, our metric coverage and visibility was pretty good, but Sometimes we realized we, would, we were building lag on, up on our consumer and our applications would just stop working and not recover, and we weren't sure why. And unfortunately, because these applications don't just run nine to five, it meant our engineers were getting paged at weekends or overnight, and quite often the only fix was just to restart the service. So because of this, we thought there must be a better way. So PageDuty actually wrote an excellent blog on this topic, which he used as inspiration when coming up with our approach. Now our approach uses two values. It uses the current offset, which is the last message sent to the topic, and the committed offset, which is the last message uh, processed by the consumer. And the way our, our checks work is they would check that the consumer is moving forward by checking that the latest offset is changing, so we're receiving new messages on the topic, and our, committed off our offsets are being committed so that our consumer is actually processing those messages. So how does this work? The first thing we do is we get the current offset from Kafka. And if this fails, we'll fail the liveness probe here because it means there's probably an issue with the connectivity to Kafka. After that, we'll get the, late, the latest committed offset from the consumer. Now, we actually just store this in memory, so this shouldn't really fail. But if it does, it probably means we're in a weird state. So we want to restart. We want to fail the liveness probe here. The next thing we'll do is we'll check if the current offset equals the committed offset. And if it does, then that's great. It means we're up to date. There's no messages actually left to process on the topic yet. So we can pass the liveness probe here. And finally, if, if, that, if that's not the case, then we'll check if the committed offset equals the same value as it did on the last time these checks were run. Because if it does, it probably means something is stalled because there are messages waiting, and we want to trigger a restart in that case. However, if the, if the committed offset has changed, then it means we're processing messages, so we can pass the liveness probe here and continue. So finally, let's see some Go code. Here's just a basic health checker struct with a check method, and this will get called every time the liveness probe is run. The first thing we do is we get a copy of the committed offset for each partition on the consumer group. And we'll have a defer function here just to update the previous committed offset values for the next run. And that will run, obviously, once the, the health check is finished. And then after that, we'll loop through for each partition and check the progress on each. So for each partition, we'll first get the latest produced offset on the topic in Kafka. And this will also test the Kafka connection. And next, we'll, get the, we'll check if the committed offset is changing so the consumer is moving forwards. And if not, we'll compare the committed offset with the latest offset on the broker to see if there are messages waiting. And if there are, we'll, we'll return error here just to fail the check. So the committed offsets will be constantly changing as messages are being processed. And typically, this will be happening in a separate Go routine. So we'll need to find a way to pass those offset values from our consumer group Go routine to our health checker so we can then update this map. So one way we could do this is with channels. So channels are a Go construct in which we can send and receive values, and they're an excellent way to pass data from one Go routine to another. So you can think of these as pipes that connect concurrent Go routines. And one of the Go problems actually mentions that we shouldn't communicate by sharing memory. We should share memory by communicating. And this emphasizes the importance of using channels to communicate between Go routines, because otherwise, when sharing memory, we can introduce race conditions or other synchronization issues. So there are two types of channels. The first one is unbuffered, and these are also known as synchronous channels. And these have no capacity, and they expect they require both the sender and the receiver to be ready at the same time. So when a Go routine attempts to send a value to a channel, and there's nothing waiting to receive it, the channel will actually lock the sending Go routine and make it wait. And on the flip side, when a Go routine tries to receive a value, and there's nothing waiting to send, then the channel will lock the receiving Go routine as well. And this just ensures direct synchronized communication between the two Go routines. And the second type, we have our buffered channels. Now, these have a capacity. So if there is room in the channel, then the send can take place immediately, and it can move on. But when a Go routine attempts to send a value and the buffer is full, the channel will lock the Go routine and make it wait. And on the other side, when a Go routine tries to receive a value from a channel and the channel is empty, the channel will lock the Go routine and make it wait until something comes available. And these are useful for decoupling consumers and producers with a buffer, which makes them great for implementing such things like message queuing systems. 
So how can we use health checker? How can we use the channels for our health checker? So first, let's create a type and let's call it partition update. And this will contain the partition and the offset value to be updated. And then if we create a channel that we shared across both our health checker and our consumer group, and this will pipe data through using this data structure. And what I've done here is I've created a start method, and basically this will run on startup of the service, and it's just to ensure that we're constantly updating the committed offset values. And this will contain a loop that will loop off the channel, and then it will, it will update the values in the committed offset map. So one common mechanism in Go when reading from multiple channels is to use a select statement like this. And basically, this will halt execution and block until a value is received on one of the channels, and it will execute the corresponding case statement. But one thing worth mentioning here is it's not deterministic if we receive messages to both cases, to, to two cases at once. It's not deterministic which one, will get in, which one will get executed first. So now let's see our consumer group and health checker side by side. So on the right, we have the consumers here. And each partition being consumed is in separate Go routine. Could, will be in a separate Go routine. And these will execute every time a message is received. So like the first thing we'll do here is we'll handle a message. We'll run some business logic here to actually handle the message on the consumer. And then after that, we'll put a message onto our notify channel. And this will tell the health checker that the offset has been updated for that partition. And after that, we'll mark the message. And this will actually commit the offset in Kafka itself. And on the left-hand side, our health checker will receive the values piped through the channel and store the offset values in our map. So there is an issue with that code. Maps are, by default, maps are not concurrent safe in Go. And, this is, and in our implementation, we have separate Go routines reading and writing from this map at the same time. So if two Go routines access a map concurrently, it will actually cause a fatal error. And therefore, we need to have access mediated by some kind of synchronization. So for this, we can use a mutex, which basically acts as a lock. And this provides two methods. It provides a lock and an unlock. We can define a, a block of code to be run in mutual exclusion by surrounding it with these calls that are shown above. And there's also another type of mutex that's worth mentioning as well, and that's called a reader writer mutex. And with this, basically, the lock can be held by either multiple readers or a single writer. So readers don't have to wait for each other. They only have to wait for the writers, which means these are preferable for data that's mostly read. However, in our case, because this is mainly going to be write heavy, I think it doesn't make a huge amount of difference here. So another thing to call out from our code is the use of context. Now, context is a fundamental part of the uh, Go standard library and should generally always be propagated through on function calls. And it provides three main functions. It provides a deadline, which can be used for timeouts on long-running requests. Uh, cancellation, which gives us the ability to signal to our Go routines to stop and shut down gracefully. And finally, request scope values. So this is a great way to share data across API boundaries. And in our code, we're also using the done function here. And basically, this is to check if the context is cancelled. So this will return a channel that will block until that happens. And when it's closed, um, the context or error will function will return a non-nil error explaining why the, cancel, the context was cancelled. And we do this for a few reasons. This is to clean up resources when the context is cancelled, ensuring no resource leaks. It means we can shut down everything gracefully, preventing abrupt halts and possible data corruption. And it also means we can help with error propagation when the context is cancelled due to an error. So now we have our health checker and consumer code written. You might be wondering how we can link this all up and run our application. So one way we can do it is like this. This here, we're initializing our objects and using Go Funks to spin up the Go routines with the channel in the main Go routine, listening to the termination signals when to shut down the app. Now, this would work in theory, but it's probably not the best way to do it. Here, we're very much firing and forgetting about the Go routines. We're not tracking their life cycle at all. And we have very little visibility into, it, into them. A Go routine should never be started without knowing when or how it will be stopped. For any Go routine where we don't have a handle on the lifetime, it could potentially be a memory leak. So when you want to run multiple Go routines in parallel and wait for the outcome, you should either use an error group or a wait group. So here's an example using an error group. Uh, in this example, we spin up the Go routine for both the health checker and for the consumer group and pause the execution in the main function using the wait function at the bottom. And if Go routines return an error, then the wait function will return the same error. And we're also using a third Go routine here just to manage the context, context cancellation and the termination signals received by the app. So just to explain these concepts in a bit more detail, uh, a wait group provides a simple way to basically spin up a collection of Go routines and wait for them to finish. And it has three main functions. It has add, which is a way to increment the wait group counter to specify the number of Go routines to wait for. It has done, which will decrement the counter when the Go routine completes. And it has wait, which will block until the counter is zero, indicating all the Go routines have finished. Now, a wait group is suitable when you want to wait for multiple Go routines to finish without error handling. And some common use cases are like a simple span out, fan out mechanism. 
However, it's important to, think, to use weight groups carefully because if the add and done calls do get a bit mixed up, it's a very easy way to cause a deadlock. So the other mechanism is an error group, and these are built on top of weight groups to allow for error handling and concurrent operations. If any Go function returns an error, the error group cancels the remaining functions and returns the first error. Another nice feature of this is you can actually set a limit on the number of Go routines that run concurrently. So if you try and spin up more than that limit, the Go team will actually block until the others have finished, until some others have finished. This is a great choice when you want to perform concurrent operations with error propagation and error handling. Some common use cases are like concurrent HTTP requests, IO operations, or distributed tasks with error handling. But one thing worth to call out for error groups, though, is that the weight will only return the first error. So if you need to handle all the errors that are being returned, then it is better to use a weight group with an error channel or something similar to that. So at this point, we built our solution for our health checks, and we were ready to try it out on our applications. And as you can imagine, we were hoping it would work perfectly first time, we just never have to think about it again. But sadly, that's just never the case. Although everything did initially work perfectly, after a few hours, we noticed some cascading failures where one pod would start crashing. It was actually related to an unrelated issue, which would then lead all the others in the deployment to start reporting unhealthy. And what we actually found out happened is when a rebalance happened, it meant the service was reassigned a different partition, which caused this to happen. So rebalancing is when partitions are redistributed across, across consumers in a consumer group. And this is basically to balance load and maintain fault tolerance when consumers join, leave, or partitions change. And due to us storing the committed offset in memory, when a rebalance happened, the service was actually incorrectly assuming that the partition values were not changing, when in reality it was just a different pod was now consuming from it. So this made us realize that we needed to change the way, we need to signal to our health checker that when a rebalance happens. And so let's just say we could remove the offset value from our map, and which meant each pod would only keep track of its own partition values. Now for this, we thought we could use another channel, or we could modify the one we already have. However, this started getting pretty messy at this point, and it meant there was a lot of moving parts. So maybe channels were just not the best way to handle this. So we thought maybe it's better to let the consumer group actually manage its own data. Uh, so what we did is we exposed an off a get offsets method like this, which returns a copy of the committed offsets map from the consumer group itself. And thanks to Go's implicit interfaces, it made it really easy to, to consume this in our health checker. Now, when storing the offset values in memory, we decided to use a sync.map, actually. And this data structure basically allows us to safely manage concurrent access to the map, which removes the need for any mutexes. And in the get offsets method, we're using the range function on the map, which basically to loop through and create a copy of it. So here's our final approach in the consumer group package. Basically, every time now we receive a message, we update the committed offset value in our offset map. And the Sarama library has some nice functionality to allow us to observe when a rebalance happens by using the context.done, as we discussed previously. And basically, when that happens, we just remove the key from the offset map, so it only includes the relevant partition values. So here's a final health check solution. Now we call the consumer group's get offsets method to receive the committed offsets. We then loop through the previous offset values and compare to the existing values, as we discussed previously. And now, but if a rebalance has happened in between the two health check runs, the offset for the partition does not, uh, will not exist in the map, which means we'll skip checking that partition. So just some things to take away from today's talk. Go to concurrency model is really excellent for building decoupled components that run in parallel. Channels are an excellent way to share state and decouple Go routines. However, depending on the use case, they might not always be the cleanest approach. And sync package has some great uh, data structures to use for concurrent, which are concurrent safe, and it removes the need for thinking about a mutex. And finally, you should never spin up a Go routine without think, without, and forget about it. It's really important to keep track of its lifetime. And finally, just some key, key lessons to go through that we learned from doing these health checks. So without proper thought, naive health checks can cause a false sense of security. An application is running as expected even when it's not, and this can lead to incidents. And building proper health checks can be the difference between keeping applications available even when there are bugs present, and the difference between getting called out for trivial issues and a service that's self-healing. So when rolling this out, we actually reduced our number of page duty incidents by 50%, which was a huge quality of life improvement for all of us. And finally, it's really important to think of the specific behavior of a service and decide what unhealthy means in each instance, just instead of just ensuring that dependent services are connected. And thank you for listening to my talk today. And please check out the Cloudflare blog if you want to learn more about our smart health checks. I'm happy to answer any questions.
So, um, just one more thing. If you scan the QR code, could you help to input the speaker's name before your question? So, just put Chris and then a dash and then your question afterwards. Yeah. So, if anyone wants to just raise their hand and ask a question, you can also do that. If you're shy, you can type into the chat. If you're not so shy, you can raise your hands. Okay, I'm coming. Yeah. Hi, Chris. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, uh, my name is Budi. I have a, a question. So, uh, how do you ensure that when uh, because currently you're checking the offset, right? Whether the offset is stuck or not. How do you ensure that the offset is stuck? Um, is caused by the port issue itself. So, restarting the port uh, will help. What, what if it's, for example, it's because of your dependency issues and uh, wouldn't be restarting makes things worse by then. Yeah, thank you. So we, we, make, a, we make a call to Kafka to get the, the la latest offset on the topic. And if, if there's no messages waiting, then we can compare and we can see that. So that, like, we wouldn't fail the liveness probe in that case. Um, otherwise, like, if it's an infrastructure issue as well, like that check, that call will fail. So we'll be able to tell that it's an issue with Kafka and not an issue with our service. But in any case, even if that does happen, like we're not going to be able to process messages. So restarting the pod shouldn't break anything here. It shouldn't cause a problem. So it's, it might not be necessary, but it's, it's like extra redundancy, basically. So let him address this one and then I'll get back to you, yeah. Okay, so the question is, what are some common reasons why your Kafka consumers get stuck and what kind of issues are caught by the health checker? So truthfully, we haven't figured out all of the reasons why this was happening. Um, it likely is some infrastructure issue like we discussed before. I think one theory is that this is caused by um, unacknowledged rebalances on the partitions. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, we're still trying to figure that one out. Okay, um, there was a question from the audience. Hi, Chris. Sorry. Hi, Chris. I'm Keith. So my question is, I, I'd like to hear you. I'd like to hear you um, share more about how you came to find that uh, a one-to-one -one consumer to partition ratio was not necessarily the most efficient. And I wonder if assigning multiple consumers to a partition. Uh, introduce, you know, it increases the complexity of keeping things synchronized between consumers and making sure that payloads are sent once and so on. Yeah, so, yeah, so basically, we actually, when building some of our Kafka consumers, we, we have metrics to measure, like, the, how long it takes to process each message, and, and also we have, like, the message rate of how long it takes to consume and, like, the lag and things like that. And what we actually did is we would scale up. We'd start at one pod and scale up to the number of partitions and just test to see the performance of each and see how long, how long it takes to process each message. And quite often, we, yeah, we found that having, like if we had 10 partitions, for example, having 10 pods wasn't always the most performant. And like we could have five, which would save, like resource, save resources on a Kubernetes cluster. And it makes it easier because there's fewer moving parts. Um, but yeah, it was just good metric coverage and good checking on that. We can take maybe one or two more questions. Final call. Oh, okay. We just got one in. So the question is, Chris, have you considered static membership to work around having to track rebalances with a synchronization mechanism? Uh, to be honest, this is not something that we've, we've, um, we've considered and we'll try, um, but it's something that I'm happy after this, we can speak more about it and see how we can use that. Okay, thank you.
Thank you, Chris, for his time.